Good afternoon, good morning, and good evening to you all. This is The Smoking Barrel. I'm Rustin Edwards, based in cold, frigid, icy Geneva with my luxurious cohort in the sunny, embalmed environs of Dubai. Yep, I'm not going to lie, mate. It weather is perfect. The doors are open. The suitcase is packed. Um, yeah, sorry the weather's cold. Hey, I've got another doing, day tomorrow. It's December. It's Advent. It's that fifth day of the calendar box. You open up and see that nice little wrapped chocolate morsel. Yeah, I do. I do. I wish I I, I, I should have got a sneaky Advent calendar. I love used to love an Advent calendar. I loved it. Like, just get up in the morning. First thing you do, mum would never go at you because you haven't brushed your teeth. Bosh, chocolate. Just <laughs> great, isn't it? I mean, love Christmas. Love Good way to kick stuff. off the day. Good way to kick off the day. And if the kids don't like the chocolate, then fortunately it makes it to my way. <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> but hey, we got, uh, you know, White Cap Mountains here in the Alps. We've got crude oil up 67 cents off the close yesterday at 78.70. Market yes. structure flirting with Contango on the Brent market. And you've got TI and Contango out until June of next year. Um, you know, the market seems to be going into fairly much of a meh uh, reaction to the whole OPEC uh, decision that was put out last week. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. I mean, WTI moved shifted into Contango, Jam Feb minus twenty four Feb minus, Yeah, it's um, you know, and the longer the I think December goes on, the deeper that Contango gets, and I think Brent follows. Look, it was um, I mean, look, we, we said last week, and you know, I said in my commentary as well that the, the group really didn't have a choice; it had to do something. But what they did was fairly ambiguous, fairly hazy when it comes to details when you looked into it properly um i.e what the group have done so there's basically two million barrels a day of voluntary cuts that the opec group have made that income that, uh, comp that comprises a million from the saudis alone we said that they would extend their voluntary cuts prince abdelaziz yesterday said that yes he'll probably extend those cuts past march which so again, most, most analysts have that in their numbers already going forward. That yeah. those all the way to the end of next year. Exactly. That's exactly what we had about a month ago when I said it to you on the potty was the Saudis just simply can't afford to test the market with more oil right now. It's way too fragile. Um, so I just think the market kind of went, well, you know, is that it? I mean, it clearly, you know, the, the deferral of the meeting was because the group couldn't agree. Um and it still looks like they can't agree. You know, voluntary cuts, what happens then with production? Um, do people trust each other within the group? Okay, you do that, I'll do this, and we trust you, blah, blah, blah. So I think it's all, you know, it's been it's been a muted reaction. 78, 68 now, we're up nearly, you know, from the low of the day, we're up nearly a dollar um, today. But I think what will happen is people will get Christmas out of the way, I think it'll be a fairly, maybe we'll touch down to 75 on Brent. I think that's where we'll go. And then people next month will really look at, okay, let's have a look what your compliance was like against all these voluntary cuts you promised. And if they don't ring true with what has been promised, then I think, you know, the market will really sell off and sell hard. Well, I think the baseline reality is that everything that they've done and they announced on the voluntary basis brings the OPEC actual production in line with what they say they're going to do because they've been underproducing for so long compared to where they should be producing. Now, granted, it's not nations that were um, underproducing that got aligned with where they're really at. It, you know, it's nations that had excess capacity dropping it down a bit. But yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that, that it's going to be a case of what do they actually do versus what they say they're doing. And that's going to take some data crunching to figure it out. And the market right now is saying, okay, fine. You say you're doing that. We don't see it happening yet. You know, stock builds out to the end of Q2. So uh, down we go and structure goes to the carry. Um, yeah, no, I, I think, I think um, it's, you know, it's an extremely difficult situation they're in. And they're led by, you know, Prince Abdulaziz, His Excellency has done, you know, His Highness, excuse me, has done exceptionally well to fuse the group together. But it's a very difficult one to maintain an, an, an aggressive narrative when take the UAE, for example, the UAE were allowed to produce 300,000 barrels more per day come January, but they voluntarily cut 300,000 barrels a day. So in essence, it's a zero change, but the headline you'll read is UAE agreed to cut by 300,000 barrels a day. So 
I don't know. I don't know if there's some some um, hopeful naivety from market players. Uh, I, I, you know, I, with the way that we looked at it, and Johannes, my colleague, wrote a really good piece last week. Is that perhaps there is some complacency? Um, you need to say that out right. I'm I'm translating it that way, not him. So throw me under the bus, not him. But it, there is there is an element of complacency. Oh, don't worry. We we've done something. We told you we would. Where in actual fact, they haven't really done a lot. So, well, it's you know, they, they, I, I got to say that you know, Saudi's been doing very well about being proactively anticipating the market despite their analytical um, um, outlays, which say the demand is so robust and so strong. Oh my God! Yet you know, they've been preempting the market as much as they can to try to support prices as long as they can, and they've done a fairly good job doing it. Uh, but I think it's a case where they're running out of ammunition against a degrading demand profile. So I mean, they have to see some real actual demand pickup from somewhere in the world to justify what they've done to get the price action they want to have. I think that they're they're very. If I was uh, on the OPEC committee right now, the JMCC, I'd be very disappointed that of all the stuff that they've done, the market reaction has been negative, not positive, and they want to see a sustained positive move, not a slow grind down lower and lower and lower. Now, I think they've acted as a parachute. Uh, they've done enough to cut the market so you don't get a sell-off towards 40 bucks, but you get a kind of a slow glide path to a point of stability of which then the economic activity can absorb that crude that's in the market until demand comes back or you get some type of economic recovery coming back into the four that then drives prices forward. And drives prices to a higher point. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's. I don't think the year has ended great for the oil market. If I'm honest, I think mm -hmm. that you know Q2, Q3 were fairly robust. We're okay. You know, um, apart from gasoline, you know, the, the distillate side of the barrel was looking good. But you know, jet fuel. If we look at jet fuel, as has you know the post still using this word post COVID recovery that has stalled. Um, China demand, you know, the Chinese data that so many were anticipating hasn't really come in. Um, it, it, it's it's okay, but I just think that I think going into Q1, you know, I know I'm not wishing the year away at all. And we're going to do a review of the year come the 18th of December, an hour long special. Bring a glass of something cold and join us, won't you, people? Um, but I would say that going into next year, I think people are a lot more pessimistic than they have been for a long time. You know, there's the grim reality of the fact that demand hasn't been as good as so many forecasts, including OPEC. And, you know, the story, the story is that people have now, looking back um, throughout 2023, is, well, if demand is so great, why are OPEC continuing to cut production? You know, it, it just it's not an argument that people can have with themselves anymore. You know, become schizophrenic, you know. Well, that was our point that we made last week, uh, two weeks ago in our last episode, is that the OPEC analytics showing this massive demand profile, yet you still keep cutting production. So obviously there's something wrong. Either A, your analytics are, are poor and you need to find a new analytic team, or demand is really not there and you're just trying to talk up the market politically just to support the market price where you want it to be. Um, so uh, they have a far more credible point if they had actual analytics showing where demand really is, and then reacting to that analytics. And then people would say, okay. oh, okay, OPEC says the market looks crap, they're cutting production. And then- Okay, so, so in, your, school, oh. in, your, in your mind then, what we think that people want and the ambiguity behind these monthly reports, if there was a report that came out once a month that, were, that, that indicated clear demand locations, where people are sending their oil, and what that looks like on a year-on-year, month-on-month basis. What what would that be in your in your view that you would want to see as a trader? What would the clear and simple graphs? How would they look? Because we have well, the ways, people. Yes, there's a lot of ways to do the, a lot of ways to skin that cat. I mean, you can look at actual import data, uh, but to me, that has to be correlated with refinery activity as well. Because it's one thing. Are you bringing in crude to store or are you actually running crude to produce products? I mean, just as recently, you know, yesterday as part of the news headlines, you had the, the Department of Energy Secretary talking that, oh, the U.S. government's going to look to fill the SPR at these wonderful prices, but we can only really buy 100,000 barrels a day because 
of the technical constraints of putting oil into the SPR is only so many million barrels a month. Yet, is that a true demand or you're just locking in forward supply against a demand spike? And again, how much of that actually comes into play? So it's one thing if a government is buying for an SPR, people would say, well, that's crude demand, which yes, it is, uh, because you are taking oil off the market, putting in tank, that oil can be released at some point in the future as well. So it's almost a net neutral versus forward supply, but it's what is the actual refinery production versus those imports? Because that to me is a gauge of consumer demand, which actually drives the prices at the end of the day. Yeah, because it's when, when we're talking about when we're talking about demo, um, news, news values that move the needle, the news values that move the market and sentiment in traders' appetite on how they look at the current state of the dynamics of your market, I would still say that the easiest way to establish on a short-term basis what is going on on a proxy are EIA data, EIA stats, right, which shows US crew production, U.S. crude um, inventories, gasoline, gas oil, you know, there's myriad you can get into, but the market reacts, bosh, as soon as the headline comes out, it looks at the first one. I just think, I, I wonder if there's a way that we could put something together, you know, in, in terms of like, okay, is there a, a way to aggregate, you know, well, the global unfortunate, balance? The, the unfortunate um problem with that is the fact that a lot of countries don't want to release their data anymore. So China stopped releasing a lot of their information to the market uh, about, what, six, seven months ago uh, because, oh, the data is wrong, it needs to be fixed, or we don't like the data, so we're not going to give it out anymore. I mean, take a look at what they've done with their unemployment numbers and, you know, anything else that was negative to their uh, story. You know, they just stopped soaring into the marketplace because they want to control the narrative of what their economy is doing. Yeah. Um, so it becomes a very hard thing to gauge as to what exactly is going on internally. I mean, you can take a look at you know what has China done. So they've increased fuel import quotas for uh, refinery processing feedstocks, but not crude oil quotas. Um, just as a way to kind of and it's trying to gauge well how what is that net impact going to be to the actual consumer? Is it that they're seeing a big spike in consumer demand, or are they just trying to increase the amount of inventory they have on hand? in case there's a problem because you're going into the Chinese New Year in approximately six to eight weeks. And right. that is going to, you know, they need to have something in stock to maintain that one, uh, maintain inventories during the Chinese New Year. Yeah. I mean, look, no, I mean, I'm, I'm not usurping what Kepler do, my great employer, is it's just, you know, there must be something, there must be a, a way that something could be aggregated to look at what it is. Anyway, enough of me uh, treading on my colleagues' toes. Um, COP28 is upon us. What's your view? How, I mean, f from here, the you know, being that it's down the road is literally two miles from my house where COP28 is hosted. Um, very positive, uh, headlines that I'm reading in the local press. How is it being reported in Switzerland? What's happening in COP28? I, I think the biggest issue in COP28 is the president of uh, COP28, uh, making the statements he made about uh, fossil fuels and the uses of fossil fuels. And we'd all be in the stone age if uh, we stopped using fossil fuels. Um, you know, so that seems to be the biggest headline out of COP28, causing a lot of analysts to at least, uh, at least some of the articles I've read over here about, you know, is it really proper to have the CEO of ADNOC also the president of COP28? Yeah, but uh, it's not, it, it's not like he just turned up as a surprise guest. I mean, Oh, look, it's me. Like he, this, oh, no, this no, but, going, but there is that you know, for a while. But when you've got a narrative of, you know, we've got to reduce the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, and fossil fuels is a big contributor to the CO2 in the atmosphere. Um, and you're not willing to admit that, yeah, we need to reduce the amount of CO2 or amount of fossil fuel consumption over the next 50 years in order to reduce the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. You've got a functional problem there. You can't be the leader of a major UN climate conference and say, yeah, nah, we're still going to stick with fossil fuels. Thank you very much. <laughs> I mean, I agree with him. Um, and Prince Abdulaziz does as well, you know. I yes, think of course, when you're, long, when you're long a few billion barrels of oil, of course you got to agree with them. But I agree with the slow phase out of fossil fuels. You can't just turn off the spigot today and say, okay, we're done. Yeah, that would destroy the world economy because the world economy is based on oil. And you got to have oil 
going through. And there's still a lot of material that is used that's petroleum based today that there is no substitute for yet that actually works. And so until you have other substitutes available, you still need to create products from oil. Yeah, but look, I mean, it, it, I think it's a lot of these comments, you know, Dr. Sultan Jabba, he's the, who's the, the, the CEO of ADNOC and is the president of COP28 and Prince Abdulaziz, the Saudi energy minister, are, are actively investing in fossil fuel production and actively investing in a low carbon environment as well. It's just been taken out of context because a lot of the statements that have been drawn in by the press in the Western world, especially, you know, in the Daily Mail or whatever nonsense people read these days, um, is that he's only talking about fossil fuels. He's not. It's a balanced argument. It's just, I, I disagree. I think it's been taken out of context. Well, the, the, you know that in, in the world that we're in today, the soundbite drives the market, yeah, not, not the details. Because of it's it. bullshit because, because it's not like... It's not it's bullshit. Like, it's just that is the way the market... People are so addicted to their TikToks, their YouTubes, their... their five second screen grab that does something and they oh my god and they don't look yeah but I, I, I disagree with it because it. It, it has to be taken into into a balanced argument but yes, you have, yes you i have know to that take it into the, a balanced argument. you have to look at the entire statement you can't just take the sound bite yeah yeah and it's it's you know the ua hosting cop that was never a problem before cop started everyone was like oh look dubai's gonna host this big conference and everyone's saying Dubai is the is the aggregator for all these big world events that's global going on. And then suddenly when people start talking about fossil fuels, everyone's going like, well, yeah, it was a mistake for them to host it. That that to me is is poor journalism and is just sensationalism. And everyone's jumping on the, you know, oh, sorry, this is a proper rant, isn't it? <laughs> so <I'm> just, <laughs> sorry. I forgot where I was for a minute. Christ. <clears throat> right. Greta just shot, shot across my bowels. No, but all these, you know, the people who are there and, you know, the peaceful protests, you know, oh, oil kills. Well, how did you get here, mate? How did, how did you get here? What did you do? Did you go on a boat did you, in a canoe or did you get on a plane? And I, I know sustainable air fuels, blah, blah, blah. I know the future. But that's I, I like to having talks as well about what I'm going to do in my future. Do you know, Russ, I'm going to lose a lot of weight next year, a lot of weight. And I'm going to go to the gym every day. That's what I'm going to do. That's my plan. But. <laughs> I'm still going to eat and get on with my daily life. I, I'm going I'm I'm to put a bottle of um, uh, Chateauneuf on that one. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll, I'll consume it within the first wee hours of January the 1st. But no, look, I mean, I am ranting. I, I'm joking. But to bring, bring it back into the prism of what we do in the smoking barrel, what you and I talk about, I agree that the, that the conversation has to be, you know, one hand making sure that everyone can get to work in their petrol combustible combustion engines um and here's zero carbon it can't be it has to be one conversation the fact that people don't want it to be one conversation i think is, is ignorant of them so i think that the, that the government has done well and i think things need to be taken into a lot more context that, well, that's my main takeaway i i think the general population needs to think remember that this is an energy transition not an energy shutdown yeah, and absolutely. It takes time for the transition to happen. It, you know, my my frames that you know we're all in a marathon and we're in mile. You know, we're not even at the first mile yet. Yeah, we're probably in the first hundred meters, two hundred meters of that race, and we're acting as if we're just coming into the finish line now, or we want to be at the finish line now versus understanding that it takes time because it, it, there is a lot of things that have to change across the whole value chain to make a a transition successful and it's only successful in my opinion if you don't end up impovertizing a vast majority of people in the world because oh yeah your cost of energy is now six times what it was uh three yeah. three, three years ago and i'm sorry but uh we can't afford to pay you your salary anymore because we can't afford to keep the lights on um when i see and um, you know i read the um virgin atlantic um uh flew from London Heathrow to JFK on only sustainable air fuel. But the only person who could afford the flight was the billionaire Richard Branson, who owns Virgin Atlantic because it's so expensive. I'm joking, Richard. In case you're listening, Dicky. Um, tricky Dicky. Um no, he's dead. Bring out the Bran bring out the Branson. Oh, sorry, it's a terrible joke. No. Um look, it, it, it's a conversation. It, it has to be 
brought down into some reality some, and practicality as well. I mean, is the future of of travel, car travel, electric vehicles? Probably. Is it a hybrid solution? No, it's not. You know, there is definitely something about electric vehicles that will take over, but I still think we've got a lot of work to do to get there. So, look, COP28 ran over. Talking about energy transition, let's talk about our favourite subject to the year, the Dangote refinery in Nigeria. First cargo apparently on its way. To feed that's, the refinery. Uh, that's the story. Both Dangote and the Port Harcourt refinery are supposed to kick off here mid-December. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so look, the story is for the, for the uninitiated who might be on a call. I'm talking to you, Ray Branson. Um, <laughs> it, there's big refinery, new refinery in Nigeria, um, built by a company called Dangote, owned by a guy called Aliko Dangote, the richest man in Africa. Long time coming, massive change um, for the whole dynamic of West African products, West African crude oil feedstocks. Well, just what and, it means and, to and the in general, the West African economy, because it basically yeah. stops the the bleeding of reserves out because you're no longer having to pay for your product imports on dollars and then hopefully get Naira back as, re, as your currency. You actually have an internal refinery producing product going into the system. So it, it yeah. changes the full dynamic of where currency ends up going. Yes, exactly. And long time, like I said, I made this point in the past, a massive thing, not just for Nigeria, but for West Africa, but for the African continent in general, yes, it's been delayed, but so has any every other refinery in the world. It's always been built. Um, I mean, look at Alzor. Been... You know, how many problems has Alzor had since it's uh, still has launched? Still has. <laughs> yes, yeah, is the refinery in QA. Um, <clears throat> there have been some misleading articles that perhaps were oh, optimistic, but those are always there. So we think, and my colleague Victoria has been following this really intently. We think we might see the first products coming out, say. Mid Q, mid, um, end Q1, beginning Q2. Based on the fact that we're getting some feed now, feedstock now, that's probably about right, I would say. Um, quite what we're going to get out is anyone's guess right now, but encouraging news, I think. Um, don't you think? Well, it's encouraging news, and I think you'll probably get something out of the refinery before the end of Q1, because if you bring the crude and you run the crude, you'll get products out. Now, yeah. is it on spec product? Is it straight run product? Um, that's the question of what will be produced. But I think with a single train refinery, before you have enough feedstock to sustain operations, you know, you will get something out of the crude tower at some point that you're going to let go. And it's going to be some type of hodgepodge material, um, you know, maybe a, a straight run gas oil, which has some very odd, peculiar qualities or a resid of some type. But nevertheless, you will get stuff out um, probably in December if they run the crude in December. Uh, yeah. If they use it, they can remember they can also use the crude as a recirculator to start getting the system up to temperature, get things up to running, check for leaks, check for this, check for that. They start trying to run throughput because the one, you know, design, you know, if I would, if my own humble opinion is that in the design criteria of that refinery, uh, there's very little redundancy. It's a single train refinery. And so you don't have two crude units, you have one crude unit, you have one distillation unit, you have one, you know, all the other secondary processing units are all single train design, uh, which for the size of the unit, you know, that's a massive operational risk, I would think, of having a single train design like that without having any type of redundancy or secondary units that you can bring up in parallel, bring one up and then wait for the second one to come up. Yeah. Um, that's a very political way of saying people. That is, they put all their eggs in one basket. I, I wouldn't say that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's, it's, it's an opinion on the design criteria. That's all it is. That's all it is. That's like saying, um, you know, I, I, I love Ferraris, but, you know, the uh, Enzo. Uh... Yeah, exactly. You drive a Tesla as well. <laughs> um, anyway. No, no, no it, it's, it's encouraging. It's it's yeah, it's one that um I think we're going to keep our eye on. There's been a few unconfirmed reports, um but yeah, watch this space. Apparently, there's a cargo on its way. Um, well, I mean, it's it, it's an interesting fact. You also, you know, the the NNPC also announced that Port Harcourt was going to be coming up as well in mid December, uh, with you know four hundred thousand barrels of crude being delivered there. Uh, yeah. Uh, so it's a very interesting dynamic that you'll have Dangote and Port Harcourt technically coming up at the same time, Port, Port Harcourt has been down since, I believe, 2020. 
Um, oh, longer. I mean, when we actually saw product coming out, it was a long, long time ago. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, it's it's a you know it's a good news story. It is, and I hope that there will be some issues, and I hope that the market doesn't kind of ingest these issues as being our oh, well, You know, it was always destined to fail because I don't. I think it's going to surprise a lot of people. So. Oh, I, I'm I'm fully uh, bullish on this refinery, and I hope that it does come up and running, and it comes up and running without much of a problem. And you know, by the end of 2024, you know, they're producing all the products they are, and actually exporting products. I'd love to see that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's. Uh, I wouldn't if I was a trader in London sitting there. What am I going to do with my gasoline cargoes? But um, you know, that's that that's what's to watch. It's not necessarily what is going to happen, what it means for West Africa or the African continent in general. Like I said. Um, and the Nigerian economy, it's the it's the whole infrastructure around it, how it's being supplied, the shipping industry, um, people's livelihoods in Europe who were used to, you know, had livelihoods in the back of this was the their, their, their you know their trade their trade routes. So let's see what happens. Um, just now, before we now, what have you guys seen about the um, uh, refinery up in Ghana, the Centuro? Nothing. Nothing. I can. I, I, let me have a look. We have the ways, people. Because the Centura refinery up in Ghana is basically the other machine that's being uh, brought up and running, which will have a production capacity of about 120,000 barrels a day. Uh, yeah. Which again will just add even more uh, product availability, and that's probably going to be more slated for the Ghana, Burkina Faso, Ivory Coast area, or where that would all go to. Yeah, I mean we've got this. I mean, hang on. Uh, if I could spell send two, I would be dangerous. Here we go. We haven't got anything right now. Um, uh, the team Royal Finder is still taking material, but no, there's been nothing yet. This one we keep, another one we're keeping our eye on. So um, want that space, as they say. Yeah, watch that, that space. space. Yeah, come to, come to, we will definitely have a focus on that coming into 2024. Just a quick one about Russian oil exports. <coughs> Excuse me. November, we had Russian crude and condensate exports at the lowest since uh, September 2022. And before that, they were lowest since um, like August 2021. So, you know, not, not great for what's happening there. If that trend continues, because it's been a bit cold, it's been a bit windy in the Black Sea. Um, if that trend continues, then... Does that offset some of the uh, concerns the market's got about coming into a surplus in Q1? I don't know. But I don't think it's anything to rely on, but it's interesting. Well, usually during the wintertime, Russia has an incentive to run refineries full and export as much crude as possible because it's hard to get the oil out when it's cold. Um, yes. And so there's always an incentive during Q1 for Russia to overproduce and then scale back in Q2 as temperatures warm up and they do their typical uh, Q2 maintenance program. So, you know, there is a lot of that that has to be taken into consideration. So I would expect to see Russia actually produce more oil than what their quota or what they said they're going to do voluntarily um, and then catch up uh, when yeah. things get warmer. Yeah, look, even Prince Abdulaziz said that he, knew, he knows, it was in a Bloomberg article yesterday, um, he actually mentioned something about this. Um let me, he said, um, you know, that they know, sorry, one sec, speak amongst yourselves for a moment. Um, he, 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 they believe him. I mean, he knows, he knows that it's very cold there, that they can't um, turn down the taps. It's just not practically possible. So um, I think there's a lot more understanding between the group. Um, but yeah, look, another one to keep your eye on. If Russian production keeps on dropping, then um, it could quickly turn structure around, but we'll have to wait and see. Yeah, it could. It could. Well, yeah, as we got to come up to the close, we all have the Fed meeting next week to look at, February, uh, December 13th, to see what uh, I'll, the I'll PayPal and company end up doing, which I think the idea is they're, they're going to do absolutely nothing. Um, uh, people are talking Fed pivot in Q1, Q2, which I think that's highly optimistic in my opinion, but uh, we'll see how the Fed actually plays it out. Yeah. Um, so something, something else to watch, another space to watch. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll be, um, yeah, like I said, I'll, I'll be really concerned about the Fed meeting when I'm on a beach. 
Yeah, when, when you're looking at that umbrella drink, I'm wondering where where's where's my bartender? <laughs> I'm not even sorry. I'm not even <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Excuse me, can I get another bottle of suntan lotion and um, yeah. another mai tai? Thank you. Yeah, and and what did what did Jay Powell do last night? Oh, what you don't care? I'll never do I. Yeah. <laughs> well, on that bombshell, um, yeah. the time is coming. Christmas shopping in now, lads. Lads, listen. Do it now. Do it by the weekend. You'll be fine. Don't wait like I always do. Only 19 days to go. Only 19. Get it done if you need to get it done. If not, just ignore this and move on. But uh, click like, comment, subscribe at your endeavor. We look forward to talking to you all back in, on the December 18th with our end of year synopsis and what we think 2024 will bring. So uh, please shoot us any ideas or suggestions you want to look at for the coming year and we'll uh, see what we can do to uh, go with it. Yeah. Ciao. Have a good afternoon.